Hey everybody, welcome back. Miss Calabrese here. Uh, so in this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about microbial growth and control. All right, so first, um, let's reestablish um, how bacteria reproduce. Um, so most bacteria reproduce by a process called binary fission. Um, it's an asexual form of reproduction, uh, which means the bacteria are basically just making an identical copy of themselves. So what was one original bacterium uh, becomes two identical uh, daughter cells. All right, and the, the way that this process works uh, is by uh, the assembly of some proteins that we refer to as FTSZ. Um, so those proteins form a ring called the Z ring that kind of uh, pinches around the middle of the cell after the bacteria have copied their DNA. So we can see uh, in this top one here, this top uh, illustration that there's, you know, a, a chromosome here and the identical chromosome over here. And then we've got this, this Z ring uh, in the middle that's going to be slowly um, tightening to pinch off those two cells so that we have two identical daughter cells by the time that we're done. All right, so, um, so we measure the growth of bacteria um, by how long it takes for the population to double in size. So that's kind of our generation time. Uh, it doesn't make sense to refer to bacterial generations in the same way that we would refer to our own generations. So for bacteria, it's basically just the time it takes for population to double in size. Okay, um, now if we're looking at um, bacterial growth rates over time. Um, this is a common graph that you're going to need to be familiar with um, to map out these different phases of microbial growth. Um, so this is what happens if you put some microbes on uh, a plate that has nutrient media on there for them to, for them to eat. Um, the first step that you always get is, is known as this lag phase. So the lag phase is where your, your bacterial cells are just kind of learning to establish themselves in this new environment. And they may need to make some adjustments to their metabolism to be able to use the nutrients in the environment that you've inoculated them into. All right, so that's a lag phase where we're not increasing the number of cells, but we're also not decreasing. It's just kind of maintaining. Uh, the next phase is called the log phase. Uh, and this is a phase of logarithmic or exponential growth where the cell number is increasing uh, like crazy. So these cells now are used to their new environment. They've, they've made all the metabolic adjustments they need to make to maximize growth in this new environment. And they're just reproducing like, like mad. All right, uh, phase three is a stationary phase. Um, so this stationary phase is where um, we're starting to kind of um, use up the nutrients that are available in, in the media here. Um, and also we're starting to die, right? So some of the cells are gonna start, die, some of them will continue to live, um, but we've got reproductive rates kind of equaling death rates. So if we're, if we're bringing on just as many new cells as we're losing old cells, uh, then we don't actually have an overall increase in population. We just have this sort of stable population. Right. Uh, and then stage four is the death phase. So this is when the population is in decline, which means there are more cells dying uh, than there are new cells uh, being generated. All right, now different things are gonna control um, uh, how different microbes reproduce. So there are requirements that certain microbes need. So for example, oxygen is one of these important requirements for microbes. Now it doesn't mean that all of them want oxygen. Some of them definitely don't want oxygen. So we can kind of classify microbes by how they tolerate oxygen. Um, so the ones over here in tube, test tube A here, these are obligate aerobes. So obligate means they have to, aerobe means use oxygen. So these guys have to use oxygen. So if we put them in a test tube like this, um, they're going to want to hang out near the top of the test tube here because that's going to be closest to the point of oxygen, right? Because there's oxygen in the atmosphere out here. Um, kind of the opposite of that situation uh, in test tube B here would be obligate anaerobes. So obligate anaerobes means they cannot have oxygen. So they, they need to be in an environment that has no oxygen. So we're more likely to find them at the bottom of this test tube here because uh, that's going to be furthest away from, from the oxygenated solution up top. Um, facultative anaerobes um, in, in this test tube here means that they're, they, can, uh, they can tolerate being in an anaerobic environment, but they, they don't necessarily want to live that way. They, they like the oxygen 
uh, definitely. So you'll see more of them clustered near the oxygen, but we can have a few that are uh, down here in this kind of anaerobic uh, region. Uh, aerotolerant anaerobes means these guys don't need oxygen, right? They're anaerobic, but they're aerotolerant, which means they can handle it. They're not bothered by oxygen at all, so we can find them all throughout the tube. Uh, and then the last one, tube E, microaerophiles. So this is a really specific type of, uh, of bacteria that are going to want to be kind of kind of have a low level of oxygen in the in the environment, not too high, not too low. Uh, it's kind of like the little Goldilocks layer of oxygen that they can tolerate. All right. So some examples of different species that fall into these categories here. Um, so for, for the obligate aerobes, that would be something like mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the causative agent for tuberculosis. Um, and if you think about it, that kind of makes sense, right? Tuberculosis is a disease of the lungs where there's going to be a lot of oxygen present. So, um, so those would be obligate aerobes. Um, clostridium, some species of clostridium are obligate anaerobes, which means they're, they're not going to like the oxygen at all. Facultative anaerobes, lots and lots of species fall into that category. So some strep species, E. coli, um, aerotolerant anaerobes, so things like uh, lactobacillus that lives in your gut, streptococcus, uh, and then microaerophiles, things like uh, campylobacter and helicobacter. All right, so other uh, growth requirements, um, uh, temperature. So temperature is going to be a growth requirement for, for different microbes. So each microbe, just like just like you, have a temperature that you prefer to live at. Uh, microbes do as well. Um, so if they if they like to live uh, in cold environments, um, then we call them psychrophiles. If they like to live uh, in kind of moderate temperatures, those are mesophiles. If they like high temperatures, those are thermophiles. Uh, and if they like ridiculously high temperatures, those are hyperthermophiles. So that means really, really high, high temperatures. In fact, if you look at this, some of these guys are living even above the boiling point. So they can, they can still survive after being boiled. All right, so those are very high temperature microbes. All right, so um, quick note on microbial control in a, in a laboratory. Um, so we have this, this way of grading uh, different laboratories based on the type of, of uh, pathogens or type of uh, microbes that you find in those particular laboratories. Um, so uh, a biological safety level one laboratory is the safest laboratory you can enter. So this is um, a lab that's only going to have very non-pathogenic microbes. So nothing in that lab is going to be dangerous to you. Um, so only non-pathogenic strains of things like E. coli, for example. Um, uh, BSL-2, um, this is going to be um, slightly uh, higher risk than a BSL-1. So these are indigenous, which means microbes that are found in that region, um, moderate risk. Uh, so definitely not something that you want to put in your mouth. We take all the precautions to wash our hands and disinfect surfaces and things like that. Um, BSL-3 is a step up from that. So these are getting into microbes that are not necessarily indigenous to the local environment and some that could possibly be lethal um, if, if you're not careful with them. Uh, and then BSL-4, those are, um, that's the highest level of biological safety. Um, these are no cure microbes that are highly lethal, uh, things like uh, the Ebola virus. Okay, so how do we control microbes? Um, so a lot of different ways, uh, and we kind of use different categories to describe different types of microbial control here. So, so here are some of the broad categories like sterilization, disinfection, decontamination, antisepsis. Um, so these kind of are describing how well we're controlling the microbes uh, and to what level we're controlling them. Uh, and also has some impact on the, like, for example, the surfaces we're using them on. So sterilization is a process that is, is going to uh, kill every microbe present. So whether it's a bacteria, a virus, whether it's a protozoan, a worm, um, whether it's the vegetative growing part of the cell or an endospore, sterilization will eliminate everything. Uh, disinfection is a step down from that. So disinfection is a way to um, reduce microbial load 
um, kill um, most vegetative, uh, like actively growing cells, but disinfection is not going to eradicate endospores, right? So it's not the same as sterilization, but it's still a very high level of cleaning. Um, decontamination is a step below that. So decontamination is really just kind of reducing microbial load. That would be the equivalent of like um, washing your dishes, washing your hands. So we're, we're dropping the microbial load, but we're not necessarily killing everything. Uh, and then antisepsis is a type of microbial control that's safe to use on human tissue. So on the surface of your skin, for example, if you use iodine, uh, that would be an example of an antiseptic. All right, so how difficult is it to kill uh, different microbes? So this is kind of a, a scale of, of resistance to, um, to different forms of control here. So, and this is, there are obviously exceptions to each of these categories, but for the most part, enveloped viruses tend to be pretty easy to eradicate on surfaces. Uh, Gram-positive bacteria, uh, non-enveloped viruses, these guys don't last too, too long on surfaces and can be pretty easily eliminated with a, with a decent disinfectant. Uh, but as we go a little bit higher in the list here, we're getting to things that are, are tougher to kill, all the way up to um, bacterial endospores. So that's going to be our, our sort of um, gold standard level of, of sanitization. So if we can destroy bacterial endospores, um, that means we're sterile, right? If we can't, then anything below that level of cleaning is not considered sterilization. Uh, but even more difficult than that to kill are prions. Why should I say kill the word kill loosely? Because prions are not um, living, um, they're, they're basically just misformed proteins that, that uh, cause infectious disease. Uh, but those um, you would have a very difficult time eliminating. All right, so, so talking about how we're killing different microbes, um, the, the process of microbial death, just like it was kind of hard to define generation time for microbes because of the way they reproduce, it's also a little bit difficult to, to um, define death, right? So we're not going to be listening for uh, a heartbeat or, or we're not counting respirations, right? Um, so microbial death, we basically define as the permanent loss of reproductive capability. So if they can no longer reproduce, even if you give the, that little microbe uh, its happiest environment with all the with whatever oxygen temperature and nutrient requirements it has if you still can't reproduce at that point then we would say that um, that the microbe is dead right so that's microbial death is the permanent loss of reproductive capability okay so um, and death because we're talking about um, microbes that are growing in colonies of millions um, death is not instant, right? So in those colonies of millions of cells, um, some might die more quickly, others might hang on a little bit longer. So, so death happens as kind of like a, a, a line instead of a point. So there's not one point at which we can say, okay, you're dead. It's, we, it takes a while to get to the point where every cell is going to be considered uh, non-reproductive at that point. Okay. Um, so we're going to be talking about some different types of antimicrobial agents here. Um, and I want to point out that, that most of these um, antimicrobial agents are going to be targeting uh, certain uh, aspects of the microbe. So some, some agents are going to be targeting the cell wall for destruction. Some are going to be targeting the cell membrane. Um, some interfere with cellular synthetic processes. Um, and by that we mean um, DNA replication, transcription, translation. Um, and some interfere with proteins by denaturing them, right? So these are the kind of basic categories of targets for all these different antimicrobial agents. All right, so examples of, of different agents that do these things. So, so um, cell wall inhibitors, um, so some detergents are going to disrupt the cell wall. Alcohols can disrupt the cell wall. As far as cell membrane uh, detergents, things like soap. Um, are going to interfere with the phospholipid bilayer of cells and disrupt that. Um, things that are cellular synthetic inhibitors are things um, that you would consider um, mutagenic, so formaldehyde, radiation, uh, and then stuff that denatures proteins is uh, anything involving heat is going to denature a protein, um, but also uh, phenolics and alcohol. All right, so um, let's Kind of break down microbial control into being either physical control or chemical control. So we'll start off with physical. 
right? So as far as physical control, um, easiest way is just heat, right? So, so high temperatures are going to be what we consider to be microbicidal. Uh, microbicidal means they kill the microbe. So if we raise the temperature high enough, you can kill a microbe. Um, low temperatures um, are usually not lethal, but they tend to be microbostatic, um, which means they all stop growth, but they don't necessarily kill. Right? So microbostatic means they stop growth. Microbicidal means we actually kill. Right? So, so heat is a, is a good way to, to eliminate microbes. And we're going to distinguish between moist heat which has the presence of water vapor um, or dry heat, which does not. So moist heat would be things like um, boiling water, using steam heat, things like that. Um, moist heat um, kills uh, microbes at lower temperatures than dry heat. All right, so dry heat will also kill, right? If you put something into an open flame, that'll probably kill it. Um, but the temperatures need to be much, much higher than they would uh, for moist heat. So uh, for example, if we look at the temperature in this chart down here, 121 degrees Celsius. Um, if I put some microbes on 121 degrees Celsius steam heat, it's only going to take 15 minutes to sterilize that. If I do 121 degrees Celsius with dry heat, so I set my oven to 121, it would take 600 minutes um, to get the same level of sterilization. So, so dry heat is going to need higher temperatures. Um, in order to kill at the same rate. All right, now low temperatures, again, low temperatures don't usually um, kill, uh, but they will stop growth. And a lot of times at lower temperatures, there isn't as much moisture availability. And it's that, um, it's that desiccation, that dryness that actually leads to microbial death. So, so cold and desiccation can dry things out or they can just stop the growth. Um, and then when temperatures uh, get a little bit higher and the air gets a little bit more humid, then they can kind of hatch out of their endospores and, and start back to life. Right. So there are there are some uh, psychrophiles. So we mentioned that word a little bit earlier. So psychrophiles are ones that that like um, cold temperatures that are able to actually grow in cold temperatures. Um, and those are the guys that are responsible for, for example, if you put food in your refrigerator and it goes bad. Um, that's because of psychrophilic bacteria that are that are just just as happy to grow at those low temperatures. All right, and then desiccation. So that just means drying out. Um, so if you if you remove the water, if you dehydrate, um, then then bacteria will die. Um, so and the exceptions are things that are are going to be um, uh, spore formers. So bacillus and clostridium that can form endospores. Those guys can survive being dried out for, for hundreds or thousands of years. Take all the water away, it doesn't matter. Those endospores uh, will survive for a long, long time. All right. Another type of physical control here is radiation. Uh, so radiation can interrupt um, cellular synthetic processes, meaning it causes mutations. Um, so different types of radiation. Um, gamma rays and X-rays are considered ionizing radiation. Ultraviolet uh, rays are considered non-ionizing radiation, um, which means you, you need higher doses of the ultraviolet radiation to, to have the same effect as, say, an X-ray would. Uh, filtration can also be used as a method of physical control. Um, so if you think a filter is just a, um, a way to, to sort uh, particles on the basis of their size. So if you have a filter that's got holes uh, small enough that it's it's not going to allow bacteria to pass through it or not allow viruses to pass through it, then you can technically even sterilize uh, with filtration uh, if the filter uh, pore sizes are small enough. Right, so there's an example of a filter. So if we've got our our liquid up here, and we've got we're we're sucking the liquid through that filter in a downward motion. If the pore sizes are so small that bacteria, viruses, whatever, are trapped above the filter, that means anything that you filtered through here is going to be sterile. Okay, so moving on to chemical methods of control. Um, so as far as chemical methods of control. The chemicals can be either liquid, solid, or in a gaseous state. Um, and they can range from being you know, antiseptics, something that is safe to use on your skin, to disinfectants, maybe something you would use on the countertop and not on your skin. 
um, to things that are totally um, sterilizing. So, and a lot of these, especially if they're in liquid form, um, we can kind of group them as either aqueous solutions, which means the chemical is dissolved in water, or tinctures, which means the chemical is dissolved in alcohol. All right, so here's some examples of uh, different chemical methods of control. Um, so if we look at, say, chlorine, uh, so, so chlorine is a, a pretty good control agent. So if we wanted to kill some uh, tuberculosis and we had 50 parts per million of chlorine, they would, they would uh, kill that in about 50 seconds, right? So not too bad. Um, uh, ethyl alcohol, uh, if we wanted to kill some staph, for example, uh, if I had 70% ethyl alcohol, I would want it to sit on that staff for about 10 minutes. So note that these times are not immediate, right? So if you if you wipe off your countertop with alcohol um, and then you, you wipe it up right away, that's not going to, to disinfect your countertop, right? It's gonna take a little bit of time for these chemical agents to work. Um, even the fastest of them are gonna take a few seconds. So if I've got um, if I've got, say, Staph aureus on my countertop and I'm going to use hydrogen peroxide at a 3% concentration, um, it's going to take 12 seconds. So you don't want to wipe it away immediately. You want to kind of let it sit there in order uh, for it to have time to do its work. All right, so a quick question here to wrap up. Um, if I'm using iodine compounds to prepare, prepare skin for surgery, um, what would we refer to that as? Right, and there's your answer. The answer is antisepsis because it's a it's a compound that we're using on the surface of the skin, so it's considered an antiseptic. All right, I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.